Lesson 10 for March 2 through to 8, God's Everlasting Gospel. Sabbath afternoon, March 2. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we come to you again to open your word, we're looking into this beautiful book of Revelation and the prophecies that it contains, but this week we're looking at a message that comes that really fits for our time. And as we do so, we pray that we may see Jesus and that your Holy Spirit will guide us each one. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Let's read that again. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Revelation 14 verse 12. Revelation shows that Satan's end-time deception will be so successful that the world will choose to worship the beast and receive its mark. Yet, Revelation 14, 1-5 tells us that God will have his remnant, those who will take their stand for the Lord when most of the world doesn't. Let's read that, Revelation 14, beginning at verse 1. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, being firstfruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. In the end, people will have to choose not whether to worship or not. Everyone always worships something, but rather whom to worship. The worshippers of the beast will receive the mark on their right hands or on their foreheads, symbolic of their choice to serve this apostate system with their deeds and or minds. At the same time, the world will witness a great proclamation of the gospel such as not been seen since the day of Pentecost. Before the judgments of God are poured out upon rebellious humanity, God will send his warning messages to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, as we read in Revelation 14, verse 6. God does not want anyone to perish, but all to be saved, which is why Christ's death was for all humanity. The question is, who will accept that provision, and who won't? Sunday, March 3, The Three Angels' Messages Just before the end, God sends his warning messages, symbolically portrayed in terms of three vocal angels flying in the sky. The Greek word for angel, angelos, means messenger. Evidence from Revelation suggests that the three angels stand for God's people who are entrusted with the end-time message to share with the world. Question, read Revelation chapter 14 verse 6 along with Matthew 24 verse 14. The first angel's message is referred to as the everlasting gospel as it says in Revelation 14 6. What does describing this proclamation as the everlasting gospel tell us about the content and purpose of the first angel's message? Why is this message central to all that we believe? First of all, Revelation 14, verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. And Matthew 24, verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, and then the end will come. 
This first end-time message is the gospel proclamation in the context of the hour of God's judgment that has come upon the world. The gospel is good news about God who saves human beings on the basis of faith in Jesus Christ and his work for them. The gospel is everlasting because God never changes. His plan was put in place even before we existed, as it says in 2 Timothy 1 verse 9, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. And Titus 1 verse 2, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time time began. The first angel's message includes both salvation and judgment. It is good news for those who give glory to God and worship him as their creator, but it also is a judgment warning for those who reject the creator and the sign of true worship he has given, the seventh day Sabbath. The three angels are described as proclaiming the messages with a loud voice in Revelation 14, verses 7 and 9. Verse 7, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of waters. And, verse 9, Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any one worships the beast and his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand. These messages are urgent and important. They must be heard by all because it concerns their eternal destiny. As such, they must be proclaimed to every nation, tribe, tongue and people. This proclamation is particularly significant because at the time of the end, the beast will exercise authority over every tribe, tongue and nation, as it says in Revelation 13 verse 7. Satan's deceptive activities worldwide in scope are met by the end-time proclamation of the gospel worldwide. The three angels' messages are proclaimed by God's people to counter Satan and his end-time allies, the dragon, a symbol of paganism, spiritualism, the sea beast, which signifies Roman Catholicism, and the false prophet, or lamb-like beast, representing apostate Protestantism, as we read about in Revelation chapter 13. They will operate up through the time of the sixth plague, recorded in Revelation 16, verses 13 and 14. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons, performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Thus, the world is presented with two rival messages, each with the goal to win the allegiance of the people on earth. So, to finish today, as Seventh-day Adventists, we are called to reach the world with the end-time truths contained in the three angels' messages. What are you doing to help do just that? What more could you be doing? Monday, March 4. The First Angel's Message, Part 1. Question. Read Revelation 14, verse 7, along with Ecclesiastes 12, verses 13 and 14. What does it mean to fear God? How does the concept of fearing God relate to the gospel? And what does the gospel have to do with keeping God's commandments? See also Romans 7, 7 to 13. What is the connection between fearing God and glorifying Him? First of all, Revelation 14, verse 7, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, 
the sea and springs of waters. And Ecclesiastes 12, verses 12 to 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. And Romans chapter 7, verses 7 to 13. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, You shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it killed me. Therefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good, so that the sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. The call to fear God and give glory to Him in Revelation 14.7 is proclaimed in the context of the everlasting gospel. A realization of what Christ has done for our salvation results in a positive response to Him. In the Bible, fearing God and giving glory to Him are closely related, as we read in Psalm 23, verse 23, and Revelation 15, verse 4. Revelation 15, verse 4. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For all nations shall come and worship before you. For your judgments have been manifested. And Psalm 22, verse 23. You who fear the Lord, praise Him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify Him, and fear Him, all you offspring of Israel. Together, they designate a right relationship with God, as we read in Job 1 verse 8, and obedience to Him. Job 1 8 reads, Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? To fear God does not mean to be afraid of him, but to take him seriously and allow his presence in our lives. God's end-time people are the ones who fear God. As we read in Revelation 11 and verse 18, The nations were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints. And those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. And Revelation 19, verse 5, Then a voice came from the throne, saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, and those who fear him, both small and great. God desires his people to love him. Deuteronomy 11, and verse 13, And it shall be that if you earnestly obey my commandments, which I command you today, to love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. And Matthew 22, verse 37, Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And God desires his people to obey him, as we read in Deuteronomy 5, verse 29. Oh, that they had such a heart in them, that they might fear me and always keep my commandments, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. And Ecclesiastes 12, verses 13. Verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. And God desires his people to 
reflect his character, as we read in Genesis chapter 22 and verse 12. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. It is important for God's people to give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come, as it says in Revelation 14 verse 7. The judgment in view here is the pre-Advent investigative judgment, which takes place prior to the second coming. The purpose of this judgment is to reveal whether or not we are truly serving God, a choice made manifest by our works, as we read in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. At the conclusion of this judgment, the destiny of each person is decided, as we read in Revelation 22, verse 11. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He is who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And Jesus will come to bring his reward to every person according to his or her deeds, as you read in the next verse. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. Judgment in Revelation 14 is a part of the gospel. To those who are in a right relationship with God, judgment is good news. It means vindication salvation, freedom, and eternal life. However, it is bad news for the disobedient unless they repent and turn to God by accepting this end-time judgment hour message. God does not want anyone to perish, but all to come to repentance, as we read in Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So to finish today, how could you stand alone in the judgment? What verdict would your life reveal? What does your answer tell you about the need for the gospel and why it is linked so closely together with judgment in the first angel's message? Tuesday, March 5. The First Angel's Message, Part 2. Revelation shows that the central issues in the last crisis of Earth's history will be worship and obedience to God, as revealed in Keeping His Commandments. As we read in Revelation 14.12, Here is the patience of the saints, here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The people of the world will fall into two groups, those who fear and worship God and those who fear and worship the beast. Question. Review the first four commandments of the Decalogue in Exodus 20 verse 2 to 11. Then go through Revelation chapter 13. What does the beast demand for worship in verse 15? The setting up of an image to the beast to be worshipped in verses 14 and 15. Blasphemy of God and his name, Revelation 13 verses 5 and 6. And receiving of the mark of the beast in verses 16 and 17 point to Satan's attacks on the first four commandments of the Decalogue in the final crisis. First of all, Exodus 20 verses 2 through to 11. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God." 
visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labour and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant nor your female servant nor your cattle nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and hallowed it. Then, going through Revelation 13, how does the beast demand for worship? In verse 15, He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast be killed. The setting up of an image to the beast to be worshipped in verse 14, and he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed." Blasphemy of God and his name in Revelation 13 verses 5 and 6. And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. And receiving of the mark of the beast, in verses 16 and 17, he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. How do these point to Satan's attacks on the first four commandments of the Decalogue in the final crisis? The central concept of the first four commandments of the Decalogue is worship. Revelation indicates that these commandments will become the standard of loyalty to God in the final crisis. The final conflict between Christ and Satan plainly will revolve around worship and the first four commandments. The key issue in the final crisis is emphasised in the second exhortation of the first angel's message. The call to worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water, Revelation 14.7, is almost an exact quotation of the fourth commandment of the Decalogue, as we read in Exodus 20 verse 11. This fact shows that the call to worship God the Creator is a call to Sabbath observance. Rest and worship on the seventh day, Saturday, is a special sign of our relationship with God. As we read in Exodus 31 verse 13, Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. And Ezekiel chapter 20 verse 12. Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between them and me, that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. The first angel's message is a call to worship the Creator. And from the Great Controversy, page 605, we read, While the observance of the false Sabbath in compliance with the law of the state, contrary to the fourth commandment, will be an avowal of allegiance to a power that is in opposition to God, the keeping of the true Sabbath, in obedience to God's law, is an evidence of loyalty to the Creator. While one class, by accepting the sign of submission to earthly powers, receive the mark of the beast, the other, choosing the token of allegiance to divine authority, receive the seal of God. And so to finish the day, how is our view of creation and salvation related? Why is resting on the Sabbath as God did 
so important. Wednesday, March 6, the second angel's message. The second angel's message announces the fall or apostasy of Babylon and identifies it as a false religious system. In Revelation 17, verse 5, Ellen White writes in Great Controversy, page 382 to 383, Babylon is said to be the mother of harlots. By her daughters must be symbolized churches that cling to her doctrines and traditions and follow her example of sacrificing the truth and the approval of God in order to form an unlawful alliance with the world. End of quote. Question, read Revelation chapter 14 verse 8 along with Revelation 18 2 and Isaiah 21 verse 9. The twofold repetition of the word fallen points to Babylon's progressive apostasy and signifies the certainty of a full moral collapse. Babylon is described as already fallen, but her fall is also described as future. Why is that? Revelation 14, verse 8, And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And Revelation 18, 2, And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. And and Isaiah 21 verse 9. And look, here comes a chariot of men with a pair of horsemen. Then he answered and said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and all the carved images of her gods he has broken to the ground. The end time Babylon in Revelation is a union of false religious systems that includes Roman Catholicism and apostate Protestantism. These will put themselves into the service of Satan against God's people. We look now at Revelation thirteen eleven to 18 Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs, so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. And Revelation 16, verse 13, And I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. And Revelation 17, verse 5. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and of the abominations of the earth. This apostate religious union will manifest the arrogance of ancient Babylon in exalting itself above God, and will seek to take his place in the world. The message of the second angel warns God's people that this wicked system will depart further and further from the truth in consequence of her refusal of the light of the end-time gospel message. 
only when, Alan White says in The Great Controversy, page 390, the union of the church with the world shall be fully accomplished throughout Christendom, will the fall of Babylon be complete. End of quote. Question, read again, Revelation 14.8, along with Revelation 17.2 and Revelation 18.3. How does Babylon make the world drink the wine of her fornication? What does this wine symbolize? Revelation 18.4 again. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Revelation 17.2. With whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. And Revelation 18, verse 3. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. Revelation 17 pictures end-time Babylon as a harlot, making people on earth drunk with her wine of immorality, as we saw in Revelation 17 too, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. The wine of Babylon refers to the false teachings and false gospel offered by this apostate religious system. Today, as many Protestant churches, in fulfilment of Bible prophecy, rapidly erase the differences that once separated them from the Roman Catholic Church and turn away from biblical truth, we witness the corrupting influence of Babylon's wine amongst the professed body of Christ theistic evolution, which is implicitly contrasted with the reference to creation in the first angel's message, theological traditions replacing sola scriptura, revised ethics abandoning biblical definitions of gender, marriage and so forth. Intoxicated people cannot think clearly. As the people become spiritually inebriated by Babylon's wine, Babylon will seduce them into worshipping the sea beast and receiving the mark of the beast. Thursday, March 7, the third angel's message. Question. How does Revelation 14.12 depict God's faithful people? Revelation 14.12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. In contrast to God's faithful people, Revelation 14.9 and 10 warns about the fate of those who face God's wrath. In the Old Testament, the outpouring of God's wrath is described symbolically as drinking wine from a cup, as we read in Jeremiah 25, verses 15 and 16. For thus says the Lord God of Israel to me, Take this wine cup of fury from my hand, and cause all the nations to whom I send you to drink it. And they will drink and stagger and go mad because of the sword that I will send among them." The severity of the judgment upon the worshippers of the beast is expressed as drinking the wine of the wrath of God that is poured out without mixture, as it says in Revelation 14 verse 10, into the cup of his indignation. In ancient times, people often diluted wine with water to reduce its intoxicating strength. But the wine of God's wrath is described as unmixed, or the Greek akratao, the unmixed, undiluted wine represents the pouring out of God's wrath in its full strength, without mercy. Question. Read Revelation 14, 10 and 11, along with Revelation 20, verses 10 to 15. How do Isaiah 34, 8 to 10 and Jude 7 shed light on the statement, And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever? <laughs> 
Revelation 14, beginning at verse 10, He himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends for ever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name." And Revelation 20, verses 10 to 15, The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night for ever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works, by the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and any one not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And Isaiah 38, verses 8 to 10, For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance, the year of recompense for the cause of Zion. Its stream shall be turned into pitch, and its dust into brimstone. Its land shall become burning pitch. It shall not be quenched night or day. Its smoke shall ascend forever. From generation to generation it shall lie waste. No one shall pass through it forever and ever. Jude 7 reads, As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. The statement of the torment with fire and brimstone refers to total destruction. Fire and brimstone is a means of judgment, as we read in Isaiah 34, 8-10, which we've just read, and Genesis chapter 19, verse 24. Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. The ascending smoke of destruction is a well-known image in the Bible. Isaiah prophesied of the future destruction of Edom by fire and brimstone. It will become a burning pitch, and Isaiah 34.10 says, It shall not be quenched night or day, its smoke shall ascend for ever. Jude describes the fate of Sodom and Gomorrah as suffering the punishment of eternal fire in Jude 7, which we've just read. These texts do not talk about endless burning, for none of these cities is burning today. The consequences are eternal, not the burning itself. The eternal fire in Revelation refers to annihilation. The burning will be long enough to make the consumption complete until nothing is left to burn. And so to finish today, although we can be thankful for the great truth that the fires of hell don't torture the lost for eternity, the punishment is still terrible enough. What should the permanence and the severity of the punishment tell us about the sacred task that we have been given to warn others about what is coming? Friday, March 8. Revelation shows that at the time of the end, God's people are commissioned with the proclamation of the end-time gospel to the world. The work before us seems daunting, all but impossible. However, we have the promise of God's power. In the Great Controversy, page 611 to 612, we read, The great work of the gospel is not to close with less manifestation of the power of God than marked its opening. The message will be carried not so much by argument as by the deep conviction of the Holy Spirit. The arguments have been presented, the seed has been sown, and now it will spring up and bear fruit. End of quote. 
The conclusion of the proclamation of God's final message will result in a great separation that divides people in the world into two camps, those who love and obey God and those who follow and obey the beast. This separation is portrayed in terms of two harvests, the gathering of the wheat into the storehouses in Revelation 14, 4-16 and the grapes to be trampled in the winepress in verses 17-20. to 20. Let's read those verses. Revelation 14, 14 to 16. Then I looked and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And verse 17, Then another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, who had power over fire, and he cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So... The angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city and blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs. This final separation is the subject of Revelation 17 and 18. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. 1. Reflect on this thought. Who is preaching the three angels' messages other than the Seventh-day Adventists? What should this tell us about just how important our work is and how seriously we should take it? 2. Why do you think that judgment is an unpopular concept among many Christians? What relevance does the concept of the pre-Advent judgment have for Christians today? How would you help your fellow believers better understand the true meaning of the pre-Advent judgment? And three, think about the question of the Sabbath in the context of final events. The issue is, whom will we worship? The Creator, or as it says in Revelation 14.7, the heaven and the earth, or the beast power? The Bible teaches that the Seventh-day Sabbath is the oldest, most foundational sign of God's creatorship of the heaven and the earth. Genesis 2 verses 2 and 3 tells us, And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. What does that truth teach us about why the Sabbath, as one of God's commandments, plays such a prominent role in the final crisis? As it says in Revelation 14.12, Here is the patience of the saints, here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Inside Story Our mission story this week is titled Power Tools and a Boat and it's by Andrew McChesney from Adventist Mission. Church members are finding innovative ways to share the gospel across the Seventh-day Adventist Church's Euro-Asian division, a territory covering much of the former Soviet Union in an effort to jumpstart membership growth which is largely flat. It's a challenging territory, but God is working through total member involvement, said Division President Michael Kaminsky. Eleven Adventist health professionals went on a two-week boat cruise to ancient Russian cities on the Volga River. The trip, which followed a popular tourist route, was organised by a Russian non-governmental health organisation, and the Adventists were invited to share health principles about water, sunshine, exercise and rest, as well as conduct stop-smoking classes. 
The boat's captain, who smoked heavily, attended the classes. He smoked so much that there was always a cloud of smoke around him, said Ivan Velgosha, president of the West Russian Union Conference. By trip's end, he had stopped smoking and made the boat a smoke-free zone. The Adventists presented him with a book about healthful living and told him that Jesus could help him never smoke again. More than a month after the trip, the captain still hasn't smoked, Velgosha said. In the city of Nizhny Novgorod, schoolchildren shared their love for God by writing letters about his law. One child wrote, We need to remember the third commandment so we don't say bad words against God. Another child wrote, If people stop stealing, we would be the richest country in the world. The children spent five days passing out the letters on city streets. In eastern Ukraine, church members have found that free drawings for electric drills are drawing men to evangelistic meetings. Women were coming to the meetings, but the number of men in attendance sharply increased when churches began to advertise the electric drills, said Stanislav Nosov, president of the Ukrainian Union Conference. Men need tools to repair homes damaged in the conflict, he said. Daily drawings were held at two-week evangelistic meetings conducted in several towns in eastern Ukraine. Winners chose between a drill and a set of pots, while anyone who attended seven meetings in a row received a food package with macaroni, sugar, milk and other basic items. Dozens of people have been baptised. God is doing wonderful things through total member involvement, Kaminsky said. And there's a photo of him here.